So the title of my presentation today, I'm going to talk about 20 minutes is drugs and youth, what we all need to know. This is just a snapshot overview of conversations that I've been having with friends and family and many of you. And I'm a substance use researcher, I've been doing this work for about two decades, but closer to the district, I'm also the parent of a ninth grader. And so I'm concerned about this too. So I hope that this helps answer some questions and gets the conversation going. So what's going on nationally? So this is data from the CDC that shows from January 2015 to January 2022, we saw a doubling of drug overdose deaths. So in the 12 months from January 2021 to January 2022, we estimate about 108,000 lives were lost in this country due to drug overdose. And as you can see in this chart, that's predominantly due to that light blue line, which is opioids. And so opioids include prescription opioids, heroin, and also synthetic opioids. And this is where we see fentanyl. And I'll talk a lot more about that in a little bit. And so what I want you to notice, though, is this dark blue line that shows in 2015, there were about 5,800 deaths in the US due to fentanyl and other synthetic opioids. In 2022, it was over 70,000. So we have seen a dramatic increase. Now, here in Texas, this is data that's from the last three years. And what you can see is we've had an increase, but not nearly as dramatic. And the other piece to note is that here in Texas, we actually see less opioid-involved related deaths. But, always a, a but, in that dark blue line at the bottom, you can see in 2019, we only had about 300 drug overdoses that involved synthetic opioids like fentanyl versus in August, April of 2022, we had almost 1,900. So we've seen a dramatic increase in synthetic opioid-related overdose deaths. So focusing more on why we're here today, I like to start by making sure that everybody knows that we have learned so much about our brains in the last 20 to 30 years. And we used to think that adulthood, 18, meant that you were ready, right? You were an adult, you could make all the good decisions and go out into the world. And what we know now is that brains continue to develop until about age 25. And what we know is that brains develop from the back to the front. So the front is where we have all of our executive functioning, our processing, our decision making, and that's the last thing to develop. And so I'll be talking a little bit today about receptors. And so I wanted to just remind people, going all the way back to that high school biology, <laughs> of how brain cells communicate. And so the neurotransmitters are really communicating through what we call receptors. And that's important for substance use because really what's happening when we use substances, and this can be caffeine, alcohol, illicit substances, any substance that we use, that is actually targeting your brain's pleasure center. And what you can see in this chart is on the left-hand side, this is how the neurotransmitters are telling our body, ooh, that donut tastes good. You see some of that dopamine going back and forth. But on that right side, you can see when somebody is using cocaine, the body is flooded with these dopamine neurotransmitters. So we are just sending signal after signal, this feels really good. And so what's a problem in adolescence, again, we're moving from the back of the brain front, what you can see on this chart of the brain is that our dopamine center, one of the biggest areas is in the middle. And so the problem is in adolescence, we have this really strong dopamine center, but we don't have the executive functioning yet. And so this actually creates a much greater risk for our kids for substance use disorder or addiction because we have this really adult-sized pleasure center, but we don't have the front cognitive processing yet. 
So I know here today we're going to be talking mostly about opioids and about fentanyl, but I also like to norm set, and this is data from the Texas School Survey that's collected throughout the state among students in grades 7 through 12. And what you can see here is in the past year, and this was collected in 2020 before the pandemic, um, what we saw is that the majority of youth that are using substances are using alcohol. So about 30% of all kids between grades 7 and 12 said that they had drank alcohol at least once in the past year. And as you can imagine, that's an average. Seventh graders, not as much. By high school and then seniors, we see a lot more. So that's followed by tobacco, which includes vaping, marijuana, then we see misuse of prescription drugs, and then some of the other substances. So I do want to focus today on what are opioids. I know it's in the media. I know it's on a lot of our minds. So again, thinking about these neurotransmitters and talking, first thing to know is that our body creates opioids. So we have opioid system in our body. When we go for a run, I'll like look to everybody on stage and you get that good feeling. What do we call it? A what kind of rush? Endorphin rush, right? So endorphin is actually endogenous morphine. Endorphins are opioids that our body makes. And we do that because it counteracts that fight or flight response. So if we're being chased by a bear, we need to decide whether or not we're gonna fight the bear or we're gonna run. And that means that we have to work a lot harder. We might need to handle getting swiped by a bear, maybe broken arms. And our body's internal opioid system kicks in so that we can be protected. So we naturally have these opioid receptors all throughout our body. So what the problem is then is these artificial opioids, the opioids that are outside of our body, they have that lock to already go into. So I like to talk about it in terms of thinking of a key and a lock. So when it's a substance that our body's really not used to, it might not fit perfectly. But with opioids, because we already have a lock that is primed for that key, when you introduce those opioids, it clicks in very easy and it clicks in strongly. And so that's really where the concern comes in for our opioids and why we can have such a strong addictive response to them. And so opioids are from the poppy. So this is a picture of a poppy. And what you'll see are just some examples of opioids here on this slide. And natural opioids, morphine and codeine, have been around since the Civil War. So then what we saw is semi-synthetics are opioids that are based on the poppy but are made in the lab. So interesting historical fact, heroin was actually made and sold under Bayer, the same people who give you Bayer aspirin. It was developed as a way to help soldiers who were addicted to morphine. So it was the treatment for having morphine addiction. And then we see the fully synthetic opioids like fentanyl, and we also have methadone and tramadol or two other examples. These are opioids that are made specifically in a lab. So they are not derived from that poppy plant. They are the chemicals that are like it. I put this slide up here because all of these are opioids. They all work the same way in attaching to those opioid receptors in our brain and throughout our body. But on average, what we see is that as you move from natural to semi-synthetic, semi-synthetic to fully synthetic, they are more potent. So they get stronger as you move down this table. So fentanyl is a synthetic opioid. It is about 50 times stronger than heroin. And so this picture that you see here of a penny, that little speck of dust that's next to it, that is about the amount of fentanyl that can cause a fatal overdose. So it is tiny. Now, fentanyl that we're seeing right now that's responsible for overdoses 
is illicitly manufactured fentanyl. So it is being made in labs in other places than in the healthcare industry. But fentanyl, prescription fentanyl, has actually been used in clinical settings since the 1960s. So many of you who have had surgeries or have had to have severe pain management might have been prescribed fentanyl or might have been given fentanyl before that surgery. And so there is nothing in fentanyl in and of itself that makes it a dangerous substance. What makes it dangerous is how potent it is. So it is so strong, and one of the ways that it has been described to me is if you went to get a shot of alcohol at a bar, and instead of giving you a shot of tequila or vodka or whatever, you get a shot of rubbing alcohol. And so just that extra potency of that substance is what causes the issue. Now, one thing that I know has been talked about a lot and I think is important that we understand what we need to be concerned about as parents and what we hopefully don't need to be as worried about, there are no verified cases of simply breathing near or touching a pill causing overdose. So a fentanyl-related overdose, you have to have direct contact with your mucous membranes. So that's the nose, that's the mouth, or the bloodstream. So there was studies done by the American College of Medical Toxicology and the American Academy of Clinical Toxicology back in 2017. And what they found was that it would take 14 minutes of having fentanyl patches covering your body and fentanyl patches are designed to work through the skin. It would take 14 minutes. And um, the other thing they tested was they saw you would have to breathe in high doses of fentanyl for up to 200 minutes before you could reach a dose that would cause you to experience even a high, let alone a fatal overdose. And so then in August of 2021, a number about over 400 drug experts, and this included health professionals, first responders, public health researchers, and drug journalists, signed an open letter where they are now asking for the media to retract articles where they are saying things like somebody accidentally touched a baggie and that's what caused the overdose. Now, I do want to focus though on what is a real concern and I hope we'll have questions and conversations about it tonight and that's counterfeit pills. And so what we are seeing is that kids are thinking and other adults are thinking that they're buying an oxycodone, they're buying a Percocet. But what you're seeing here is on the top is the authentic what you would get from a healthcare professional. The bottom picture is a counterfeit pill. And this pill was found by the DEA to have fentanyl in it and to have enough fentanyl in it that it could cause a fatal overdose. So if you are somebody who is not used to using pills and you're given that one on the bottom, are you really going to know the difference? This is another example, benzodiazepines. So these are you know, tranquilizers. Um, this includes Xanax, Ativan, different things, Valium. And what we see here is on the left-hand side, the white one is the authentic from a healthcare provider. The yellow is counterfeit with fentanyl. So again, kids might think that they're purchasing a Xanax when really they're getting a pill that's filled with fentanyl. I also want to point out that it's not just about fentanyl and it's not just about opioids. We're also seeing, in this case, Adderall, where the top one is the authentic pill that you would get from a psychopharmacologist, and the bottom is a counterfeit Adderall that has methamphetamine in it. So this is really a concern when we're talking about fatal overdose as well, because these counterfeit pills are not made in a pharmaceutical lab. So we talk about it being like a chocolate chip cookie. Ideally, your cookie has the chocolate chips all throughout. But we know most of the time you have one cookie that doesn't have a lot of chocolate chips, and then one of your kids lucks out and gets the cookie that has, you know, 50 chocolate chips in it. 
The problem with counterfeit pills is that you could split the pill in half, split it with somebody, the one person has a part that has no fentanyl in it, and the other one has a fatal dose of fentanyl. Or it could be even from the same batch of pills. One pill has a fatal dose of fentanyl and the other one doesn't. So this is why we're really concerned about counterfeit pills. And a recent article came out showing that um, the DEA has seen just this exponential increase in the last five years. So going from a little under 300,000 pills seized to almost 10 million pills seized in the last few years. So I wanted to make sure today when we're talking about all of the things to be concerned about, what we can be doing. And so naloxone or Narcan is one of the most beneficial things that I think we need to know about when it comes to opioid overdose. So again, this little picture on the right, we're going back to receptors. And what naloxone does is it takes that opioid that's sitting on the receptor and it pops it off. So the naloxone is a better key to that opioid lock than the opioid is. And so it forces that opioid off. It can be administered by anyone. One of the real benefits of naloxone is there's no psychoactive properties, meaning it's not an opioid. So if somebody is not having an overdose, you're not going to end up getting them high and there are no harmful effects. So there are no reasons if you think somebody is experiencing an overdose not to give them Narcan. Now, one of the important pieces that we need to know as well is that Narcan only works on an opioid overdose. So if there's alcohol poisoning, if there's other drugs, methamphetamine, cocaine, benzodiazepines, Narcan doesn't work. It only pops off those opioids. And it's short acting. So typically it will wear off in about 20 to 90 minutes. And so it's critical to call 911, make sure you're getting the first responders there, and to make sure that you stay there until help arrives or at least four hours to make sure that that person is doing okay. I wanted to show for people here and live streaming, this is a box of naloxone. I actually purchased this from my pharmacy last week. In the state of Texas, you do not need to have a prescription for it. You can go to any pharmacy and you ask and you say, can I get naloxone? And I went after work, so it took a little bit of time, but within an hour, I had the naloxone and it was the copay for my insurance. So anybody can get naloxone. It is shelf stable. Um, now that it's finally cooling off in Texas, we can start to have it in our cars. Ideally, you would keep it in a cool, dry place, but it also doesn't expire for two years. And you get two doses in a box. Okay. So I also wanted to end my part, and I really appreciate everybody for sticking with me, <laughs> on why is it that youth use drugs? What do we do for prevention? So we were talking before we started today that we're talking a lot about what we do once somebody is already using, and we know the best thing we can do is prevention. So understanding why is it that youth use and what is it that we can do? So back in 2017, the Surgeon General of the United States convened a panel of researchers and scientists and public health professionals to really look at all of the data over the last few decades to say, okay, what works in terms of prevention, in terms of treatment, and also recovery support services? So what I'm going to show tonight is just an overview of what has been shown to work. So at the individual level, and what you'll see is everywhere that there's an X, that means that these factors are associated with adolescent substance use or adolescent substance use disorder, and the same thing for young adults. So at the individual level, we know that there's a genetic component. Individuals who have a family history of addiction are more likely to experience addiction. We also know early initiation. So going back to that, one of those first slides, 
the brain development, we know that using before the age of 14 presents a much greater likelihood of having substance use disorder in adulthood. Early and pers persistent problem behavior. So this can be as early as kindergarten, first, second, third grade, um, that if we see different behaviors popping up, that actually is linked to a higher likelihood of substance use. Sensation seeking or impulsivity, and also attitudes towards substance use. So if we ask kids, how dangerous do you think it is? If they don't think it's that dangerous, they are more likely to be using. We see peer substance use and also a number of family behaviors. So family conflict, but also family attitudes towards substance use. So do we have a lot of substances in the home or do we talk about substances? Um, if you think your parents approve of substance use, you're more likely to use. Then we see at the school level, lack of school connectedness. So making sure that we have our connected kids. Also at the community level, low cost of alcohol. The cheaper it is to get something, the more likely they are to use. High availability of any substances. So the other show and tell I brought today is a drug disposal bag. And so all schools have those bags, Christina was telling me. Um, so, you know, you can actually put in this small bag up to 15 pills and dispose of it safely. So disposing of substances that are in your home. We also know media portrayals, low neighborhood attachment and community disorganization. But what are the protective factors? What can we be doing? So first is social and emotional skills. So knowing how to cope with failure, knowing how to collaborate with others, really dealing with those bumps in the road and knowing how to get along with others helps us. Self-efficacy, and this really gets into those refusal skills. Can I be confident in saying that I don't wanna use or I don't wanna really take that pill? Thank you for offering, but no thank you. Um, we also see opportunities for positive social involvement. So being able to volunteer, participating in after school activities. Also recognition of positive behavior. So we often are talking to our kids when they're doing something that we're not really thrilled with, but do we actually say great job when they're doing what we want to see? And then again, finally, the attachment and the positive communication with family, school, and community. So key takeaways. First off, teen brains are vulnerable. We need to look after our kids. Second, alcohol is still the most used substance. Counterfeit pills are a threat. Naloxone saves lives. When we are talking about opioid overdose, it is a lifesaver. And finally, alcohol and drug use is preventable and we can delay initiation. And so I'll wrap up today with a quote from the Surgeon General's report, which is just to say that we all play a role. And I really appreciate being here tonight and being able to be my little part of helping our community be safe. Thank you.